And at this time, I want to invite a, a, a dear friend of mine uh, and a wonderful missionary to come up and speak with us this morning. Uh, Brother Alf Wilkes is a missionary with Word of Life. Well, good morning. When, when Pastor Mike asked me if, uh, if I would be available to, to fill in today, he explained to me that he and Katie and a number of other couples were going down to Montrose Bible Conference for a uh, couple's retreat weekend. Well, this past week I came across something on Facebook that maybe you saw it as well. It goes like this. You should be as excited about church as about the Super Bowl. So when your pastor makes a point this Sunday, pour Gatorade over his head. (laughs) I I gave a a glance around. I have not seen any big uh, orange coolers of Gatorade. Uh, Maybe there's one hiding, but perhaps that is why he uh, brought in the backup quarterback uh, for this morning. But uh, either way, I I am uh, happy to be here. And looking forward to uh, getting into God's Word. Just a little uh, brief information, uh, a ministry update on what has been going on in our life and in our ministry. Uh, Probably the biggest thing uh, since about the end of January is uh, seven straight weekends of snow camp. Now, we're only able to go to to one and be there, which was uh, last weekend. And uh, just a great time, 370 young people and their leaders uh, spending the weekend at uh, Word of Life Snow Camp. Yes, there is snow in Scroon Lake, New York. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> not as much as other years. They did have to bring in uh, some backup. They brought in a, a rented a snowmaking machine so they could make sure that the tube hill and the snowboard hill and all that had uh, sufficient snow uh, and uh, going great. Uh, Over these three weekends, so far we have seen 101 young people make a first-time decision for Jesus Christ. That is what it's all about. Um, The weekend we were there, there were 20 that made a decision on Friday night. And uh, I I, I do want you to pay attention to what God has to share from His Word this morning. But keep in mind, too, that right now as we're meeting here, They are wrapping up with their Sunday morning service up there in Scroon Lake and uh, just challenging young people, what are you going to do with your life? But more importantly, what does God want to do with your life? And will you make yourself available to serve him however he wants? Was uh, talking with... uh, young couple this this past week and uh <clears throat> they're just uh excited about a new house that god has allowed them to to purchase they're waiting on a closing date and at the same time they've just recently made a a, a change in in their local church they needed some place that they could use the gifts and abilities god had given them to to serve and they were still trying to figure out How does that look for us in this local body of believers? And I remember a long time ago hearing this little little phrase, if God calls you to clean toilets, don't stoop to be a king. We've all got gifts and abilities that God has given us, and these young people this morning are being challenged that they're at a point in life where they may not have any clue what God has for them in the future. And that's okay. They've got plenty of time but will they make the commitment to allow God to use them however he sees fit? This morning, if you would take either your printed copy of the Word of God, or if you have an app in your lap, whatever it might be, turn to John chapter 9. John chapter 9. And if, if you are able to, I would invite you to stand with me as I read this passage. We're going to read John chapter 9. Verses 1 through 12. John chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? 
Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. Thank you. You may be seated. This, this passage has a lot in it. And there is a lot that we could unpack. Uh, but I think you guys would like to go home at some point today. Um, but what I want to do this morning is, is kind of set the stage of how we get to John chapter 9 meet some of the key players in the story. And then there are two verses and specifically two words that I want to zero in on and challenge us with today. Now, as Jesus began his his earthly ministry, as we have it recorded in the book of John, in John chapter 2, we have the story of uh, Jesus turning the water into wine at the wedding at Cana. Right after that, we find him in the temple, Clearing the temple, his house of worship, of the money changers. In chapter 3, one of the, the religious leaders' own, Nicodemus, under cover of darkness, comes to Jesus seeking answers to his, his questions. In chapter 4, we see Jesus break down the, the societal and racial barriers as he meets with the woman of Samaria. In chapter 5, Jesus heals a man at the pool of Bethsaida, tells him, pick up your bed and walk, and this was all on the Sabbath day, and this infuriated the religious leaders. This is just a sample of what Jesus was doing as he taught And as he confronted these religious leaders, these scribes, these Pharisees, with their lists of laws that they said man had to abide by. But Jesus was not here to make friends. Uh, In chapter 8, if you look at verse uh, 44, maybe on the same page there, um, Jesus says, you are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. I don't imagine this set very well with those that heard him say that. I I, I could be wrong. Well, then in verse 58, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Okay, now you're messing with our father Abraham, who we all came from. You're not just teaching now, you're starting to meddle in affairs. The next verse, verse 59, the end of chapter 8, it says, So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. They were, what you might say, furious with what he was saying. Well, now as we get into uh, chapter 9, as we just read, It starts out, as he he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. Now, in Bible times, people like this man who were blind from birth or who were crippled, who could not provide through work uh, to make a living, were forced to beg. And they would do this outside of the temple 
because generally people who are going to worship tend to be more generous, more com- compassionate. And so this was like the, uh, the prime spot. If he was going to be forced to beg to stay alive, this was where he wanted to be. But he was not the only one there. Often there would be a whole bunch of different people with different ailments, all asking people to help them. The disciples ask Jesus an interesting question in verse 2. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? You see, they're, they're curious, but not compassionate. They're curious, how, how did this guy get to this point? Now, human beings generally seek for answers or rationale that can help them deal with the hard questions of pain, suffering, and evil. They did not see this man in a compassionate way like Jesus did. They saw him as an opportunity for a theological discussion. You see, the the religious leaders of the day went so far as to believe that sin in a person's life or in parents' lives could cause things like this man's blindness. This, This is why he was blind from birth. It was something that he had done as a sin. It was something his parents had done. Matter of fact, Jewish uh, teachers even believed that a fetus could sin while in the mother's womb. I had, as, I was, as I was studying and I, and I read that, I had to read it like three or four times. And it's, it's like you, you read that and you're like, really? But that just shows how bizarre some of these man-made rules and laws were. Now, you think to the book of Job... And Job's three wonderful friends, who the best advice they gave him was in the first seven days, because in the first seven days they just sat there with him. They didn't say a word. Day eight is when the trouble started. But even they agreed and said, Job, what have you done? There must be some sin in your life that you need to get right that has caused all this tragedy in your life. And as Job himself said, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. As we move on in verses 6 and 7, having said these things, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Jesus here demonstrates his power. The Pool of Siloam was about a quarter of a mile from the temple gate, which they believe is where this man was seated. So, first of all, he's blind. And now Jesus makes mud and puts mud on his eyes and says, now I want you to go to the pool and wash your eyes. This man has been blind from birth. We don't know how long he has been coming to this spot to beg. So like many people today who need to adapt with different uh, things that God sends our way, he may have known exactly how he needed to go to get to the pool. Maybe he had friends who were there that, that helped him. They came and checked on him every once in a while, helped him get back home. You know, I don't know about your mind, but I read some stories like this in the Bible, and I I have all these weird questions that don't matter, but in my head. Like, how how did he get from from there to the the pool? But he goes, and he washes his eyes, and he can see. He came back seeing. Now, verses 8 through 12, we have his neighbors. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? These are not the neighbors 
of the State Farm kind? You know, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there? No. These, these are not the, the type. Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said it is he. Others said, no, it just looks like him. He kept saying, I'm the man. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a group situation. You're talking amongst people, and they start talking about you like you're not there. It's like, guys, I'm right here. I'm the one. I was blind. You know me. I was the one who was blind, but now I see. Does it remind you of a hymn and a hymn writer? John Newton, I once was blind, but now I see. They ask him in verse 12, where is he? Where is this man who gave you your sight? He says, I don't know. Just as in the, the, the end of chapter 8, it appears that Jesus has just kind of slipped away. He's, he's done what he needed to do. And he slips away. How many remember Hills Department Store? Anybody remember the old Hills Department Stores? <clears throat> Growing up in the Elmira area on Lake Ave, there was an old Hills Department Store. And I remember my first and only time shopping with my mom where I thought it would be fun to hide on her. <laughs> Anybody else been there? <laughs> so I slipped into the middle of a, one of these round clothes racks. It was just packed of clothes. And uh, I thought, ah, oh, she'll never find me here. And then I slipped out looking for her, and I couldn't find her. <laughs> Jesus has, has slipped away. He's not gone, but he's kind of s- removed himself from, from the scene so that we can get a little bit better focus. Now, as we, as we walk down through, starting at verse 13, we now have the Pharisees on the scene. In verse 13, we have these neighbors again, referred to as they. These wonderful neighbors. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been formerly blind. Now, they they wanted to know what had happened. And so they start interrogating him. Who did this? How did this happen? Matter of fact, uh, and he shares he shares the story. Verse, uh, verse 18, the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? Verse 20, his parents answered, why don't you ask him? He's a grown man. He's right here. You ask him. So the the Pharisees uh, interrogated both this man and his and his parents. As we get to the end of chapter nine, Jesus comes back. Verse thirty five. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, "Do you believe in the Son of Man?" He answered, "And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him?" Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Just a phenomenal passage. And like I said, these these verses contain so much that we could unpack. But I want to go back to a couple of verses that we kind of skipped over, and I want to focus on verses 4 and 5 as Jesus was talking to his disciples, and they missed the whole purpose. Verse 4 starts out, we must work the works of him who sent me. Depending on your translation, it might even say, I must work. But most translations agree and say, we must work. Jesus is including us in his work.
But the bigger word in my mind is the next word, must. Now, must has the meaning of uh, to be compelled to in order to fulfill some need or achieve an aim. To be obliged to. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to give away one of my, my loves, and that is peanut butter. Specifically, Jif peanut butter. <laughs> now, ladies, if you are making a peanut butter cake, and you're putting all the ingredients together, and you realize I don't have any peanut butter for a peanut butter cake, you would say, I must go to the store and buy some Jif, right? Yes. <laughs> Guys, you've got your vehicle up on the blocks. You're changing the oil. You got this. I don't need to go to no instant oil change place. I got this. Get all the oil drained out. Go into the garage. And if it's like my garage, oh, no, my son's used the oil for something else. I have no oil. I must go to the store and get oil to put it in my car. And I can't take that car, so hopefully there's another one around. If your home is on fire, I must call 911. I must have somebody call 911. The word must conveys a sense of urgency. Jesus says... We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. Now, I am by no means a Greek scholar, and I am not going to pretend to be. But what I can do is click buttons on the computer. And any of us can, in just a matter of a few clicks, can do our own word study into some of the original languages for, uh, for the 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 original languages. But the Greek word used here for must in other places is translated as ought, must needs, needed, should, all words that convey a sense of urgency. John 3, 7, when Jesus was meeting with Nicodemus, he says, you must be born again. In that same conversation with Nicodemus, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. In John chapter 4, when he was with the woman of Samaria, uh, it says he must needs pass through Samaria. To him it was a sense of urgency. In Acts 4.12, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There's an urgency. What does Jesus say we must do? We must work the works of him who sent me. Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That is why God sent his Son, to save the lost. I don't know if you watch much news. It can get a little depressing. So sometimes it's not good to have a, a constant diet necessarily of, of that. Um, but our world's in pretty rough shape. Not just the United States, the whole world. What I'm thankful for is that, at least for me, this is a rental. This is just a rental. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not here, in the grand scheme of things, I am not here for very long. Our lives are a vapor. This man had been born blind so that one day God would receive glory as he was healed. See, just like, just like the disciples, you and I tend to focus on the why of life. Why did this happen? Why did that happen? Instead of focusing on the who. The who of Jesus Christ. Jesus says to them, if I may paraphrase in my my words, look guys, 
You're wasting your time here worrying about what's not important. Now, come on, we've got a lot of work to do and a short amount of time to do it in. You see, I I look at this verse 5, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And I'm not trying to add to Scripture. Please hear that clearly. I'm not trying to add to Scripture. But if while he is here, he is the light of the world, I can't help but think when he is not here, who's the light of the world? You and I. We are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. Our mission here on earth is to rescue people, to point them to him and what he has accomplished for them. As we, as we talked about this word must, we must work the works of him who has sent me. I'm reminded of the, the old hymn, Rescue the Perishing. And I want you, as I read some of the lines from this hymn, just to sense the hymn writer's urgency. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Snatch them in pity from sin in the grave. Weep o'er the erring one. When's the last time you or I wept about somebody that we care about that does not know Christ? Later in another verse in the song, it says, Plead with them earnestly. Do we? Do I? Rescue the perishing. Duty demands it. Strength for thy labor the Lord will provide. Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. On the 18th of April in 75, hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year. So opens Longfellow's poem on the midnight ride of Paul Revere. And as he goes through that poem, he talks about how the plan was going to go. Hanging lanterns in the Old North Church. How with whatever amount of people and resources the colonists had they were going to battle the British and we we all know Paul Revere and his ride to warn the towns but few have heard of Israel Bissell anybody ever heard of Israel Bissell he was a humble post rider that was part of the Boston to New York Post ride. After the Battle of Lexington and Concord on April 19th, 1775, Bissell was ordered to raise the alarm in New Haven, Connecticut, about 140 miles away. He reached Worcester, Massachusetts, about 50 miles away, and normally a full day's ride in two hours. Tradition has it that as soon as he arrived there to get a fresh horse to continue his ride, the horse he had ridden to Worcester collapsed and died. Pausing only to get another mount, Bissell pressed on and by April 22nd was in New Haven, but he didn't stop there. He rode on to New York, arriving April 24th, and then stayed in the saddle until he reached Philadelphia the next day, April 25th. Bissell's 126-hour, a little over five days, 345-mile ride signaled American militia units throughout the Northeast to mobilize for war. In Israel Bissell's mind, and also in Paul Revere's mind, we must warn the colonists. We must mobilize for battle. Is the message any different for us today? We must warn friends, family, strangers. We must warn them. But the beautiful thing is, we have hope that we can share with them. 
the hope of Jesus Christ and what he did in our place. We have uh, a message of both bad news and good news. I want to challenge all of us this morning. Perhaps as we've been looking at this passage, God is laying somebody on your, on your mind and on your heart. That he's saying, you must talk to this person. You must share my love. You must share my message. Are we motivated to tell others the good news we have out of love for them and concern? Are we more concerned about the who or the why? If not here, where? If not now, when? And if not us, who? You have connections in your life that perhaps nobody else sitting in this auditorium has. You and you alone are a connection to that person. You have connections to people I have no idea even exist. What are we going to do with those connections? Those friends, family, neighbors. Do they even know that we're a Christian? With heads bowed and eyes closed as we close, Christians, I want to challenge you today. God has called us, he has left to us a great work, an awesome work. Would you just take a minute and in the, in the quietness of your heart, just talk to him. Ask him, who would you impress on my heart and on my mind that I need to talk to this week? Maybe there's somebody that you know that is facing some health situation right now. Maybe their days are limited and they need to hear from you today. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you say, you know, you, you talked about different tragedies. And if a life-ending tragedy came to my life today, I do not know what my future is. Maybe you do know what your future is. Maybe you've heard this message and you've heard of God's love and forgiveness. Maybe you've heard it before. But you have made the choice to reject it. I would beg with you. I would plead with you. Do not leave here today without getting that right. There are many here within the church. Myself, Pastor Matt. Many that would love to take God's word, the Bible and sit with you and show you how you can know today without a shadow of a doubt that your future is secure, that your sins are forgiven. 